morning. Yes. I'm Henry with Sandra McNeil. Oh, okay. What's your name? Josh Lash. Okay. Right in front of this little apparatus, right here in front of me. Okay. Oh, right here. Got it. Got your temperature taken. Yeah, of course. Keep, keep the mask on. Yeah, of course. Can you sign in your name and the tent, please? Please pass. Okay. Please pass. Uh, ninety-six point six. Thank you very much. Anything else I need to put down here? Oh, uh, just your name and uh, the temp, and you can go right through here. Through here? Down six steps until you're right. Walk out into the room, and you'll see people out there. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. In the basement of Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. Sandra McNeil sifts through cassette tapes of old sermons. Hi, Sandra. I want to. Hi, Josh. Hello, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Do, I'm doing just fine. I don't want to interrupt you. Should I just uh, take a seat and wait to your, your set? Yeah. Well, She's the historian of the church, which has been a site of faith and community for black New Yorkers for two centuries, though not always at this location. Oh, we started in 1808. <laughs> in the Five Points area on Worth Street in Lower Manhattan. Um, from there, we moved to Waverly Place in Greenwich Village. Then we moved on 40th Street, West 40th Street. The church moved to its present spot in Harlem in the 1920s. Here, Abyssinian both sticks out and blends in. If you were walking down the street, you might even miss it. The church's gray stone veneer matches the brownstone apartments that surround it on all sides. But take a second look, and you'd start to notice the exceptional beauty. The doors are pointed arches painted a brilliant red. A massive stained glass window pulls your eye upward where two turrets jut out into the sky, breaking up the straight line formed by the tops of the neighboring buildings. It's spectacular. Inside is even more spectacular. McNeil takes a break from her work to show me around. This is the sanctuary. The sanctuary, as well as the community room, were built in 1923. The church opened in June of 1923. And it has not changed a whole lot since then. There's these intricate stained glass windows on each wall. These are the European stained glass. Those on the sides are the American stained glass windows. There's not one, but two pipe organs. The organ that's there is specially made for this sanctuary. Um, and it, we got it during the pastorate of Samuel DeWitt Proctor who was very much into not just preaching and bettering communities, but also into music. The attention to detail is incredible. The pulpit is Italian marble, shipped all the way from Italy. Um, and that little pedestal there is the pedestal that on a Sunday morning, we will see that Coptic cross that was, the, that was gifted to us by Emperor, uh, Emperor Haile Selassie with the stained glass windows all about. That particular window is that of the descending dove. On Communion Sunday, this red platform, if you will, is lifted. Warm water is placed in the baptismal pool, and we do full baptism by submersion. This is one of the oldest Baptist churches in the country. So much has happened in this church over the years. We have had great times. We have had not so great times, but it has always been not just a church of the people who attended church, We've always had the philosophy of church and community. I came to Abyssinian because in 1930, a young German pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer came to this very sanctuary in need of revival. It was here at this historic black church in Harlem that Bonhoeffer underwent a profound transformation as a theologian and as a man. 
it was the the God that was preached from our pulpits, uh, the Christ, that Bonhoeffer really didn't know. He'd never gotten Christianity in this way before. He was mesmerized, converted. <laughs> um, Bonhoeffer's experience at Abyssinian showed him the importance of a church community that was political, that uplifted the downtrodden, that centered the marginalized. When he returned home to Germany in 1933, amid the rise of the Nazis, the lessons of Abyssinian became a guiding light for him. I think he thought he could take it back with him. He was so overwhelmed and overcome and changed, really changed by it, that he thought that he could take it back. But history tells us, no, no. This is From Sin to Saint, a podcast from Pathios. In each season, we will look at the true stories of redemption of saintly figures from all faiths. This season, we are looking at the life and legacy of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor who wrote theological classics and was executed for his role in resisting Nazi rule. I'm Josh Lash, a journalist and a historian. In episode one, we looked at Bonhoeffer's childhood and education as a proud member of the German elite. We examined his ties to anti-Semitism, the travel abroad that challenged his nationalism, and his developing vision of a church community. In this episode, we will look at the most transformative period of Bonhoeffer's life, a four-year stretch between 1927 and 1931, from his first pastorate in Barcelona, which left him disillusioned, to his revelatory year in the United States, and finally, to his early battles with Nazism in his homeland. We will return to Abyssinian Baptist Church and Bonhoeffer's time in Harlem. But this chapter of his life does not begin there. It begins back across the ocean where we last left off, at the University of Berlin. Bonhoeffer successfully defended his dissertation, Sanctorum Communio, in December of 1927. The work outlined his sweeping vision for a church community. There was only one problem. Aside from a short stint as a youth minister in Berlin, he had never really been in a church community. A few months before his dissertation defense, Bonhoeffer received a call that would change all that. It was from the superintendent of the Lutheran Church in Berlin. He offered Bonhoeffer his first job in a church as an assistant pastor to a colony of German expats in Barcelona. Bonhoeffer leapt at the chance to put his education into action. He wrote about it in his journal. Superintendent Diestel telephoned to offer me a position as a vicar in Barcelona, which brought to fruition a wish that had grown stronger and stronger over the past few years, namely, to stand on my own feet. In February of 1928, Bonhoeffer said goodbye to his friends and family and hopped on a train to Barcelona. When he woke up in the Spanish countryside, he was floored by the natural beauty he saw. I woke up. The sun was just rising and illuminated a pre-spring landscape that looked like it came from a fairy tale. The meadows were green. The almond and mimosa trees were blooming. I saw the snowy peaks of the Pyrenees shining in the sun and the blue sea to the left. He was picked up at the station by the senior pastor of the parish and brought to his new Spanish home. Barcelona couldn't have been more different than Berlin. The city was a garden of earthly delights. Each day was more fun than the last, filled with delicious food, strolls along the water, and lots of socializing. Bonhoeffer spent his time in Barcelona soaking up the sun and the energy of the city. He even let his hair grow out. In the evening, he would go for hikes in the mountains. I watched a sunset I will never forget. 
a blue and then violet haze settled around the mountains. In the foreground, there were enormous cacti and trees in blossom. There were about 3,000 expats in Barcelona's German colony. Most were spectacularly wealthy and loved to flaunt it. They threw lavish parties and always invited Bonhoeffer. He found himself at the center of a vibrant social scene, eager to pick the brain of this brilliant young pastor, usually over a glass of wine. Well, I am doing extremely well. I have the advantage of being admitted everywhere and even being a rather popular guest. I drink hardly any water here, but rather exclusively wine. Among Bonhoeffer's favorite activities in Barcelona were the bullfights. It's a great spectacle to see wild, unrestrained power and blind rage fight against and ultimately succumb to disciplined courage, presence of mind, and skill. The majority of these spectators do indeed just want to see blood and cruelty. Overall, the people vent all these powerful emotions and you get drawn into it yourself. Ever the theologian, Bonhoeffer compared the frenzied crowd at the bullfight to the mob that turned on Jesus in the Bible. I have never seen the swing from Hosanna to crucify more graphically evoked than in the virtually insane way the crowd goes berserk when the Toreador makes an adroit turn and they immediately follow this with an equally insane howling and whistling when some mishap occurs. I think it's no accident that in the country with the most gloomy and stark Catholicism, the bullfight is ineradicably secure. Here is a remnant of unrestrained, passionate life. Perhaps it is precisely the bullfight that, by stirring up the entire soul of the people, indeed fanning it into a frenzy, renders possible a relatively elevated morality in the other areas of life, since those other passions are killed off through the bullfight. So the Sunday bullfight constitutes the necessary counterpart to Sunday Mass. He even sent his family a postcard of him dressed as a bullfighter with the caption, Greetings from the Matador. Just 300 of the 3,000 or so German expats were church members. And on any given Sunday, less than 50 actually attended service. They liked the idea of church. They just didn't want to actually go. The attitude of these people toward the church is just as positive as their attitude toward sports or toward politics. It's just they are not very active. Bonhoeffer's responsibility as the assistant pastor was primarily the children's ministry. He found that these kids were quite different from the children he had worked with in Berlin. Like their parents, they rarely, if ever, attended services. And to Bonhoeffer, they were frankly a bunch of spoiled brats. I seem to have precisely the most difficult children, lazy bones, good for nothings, precocious. They give me the impression of being not at all serious. They have experienced nothing or very little of war, revolution, and the painful aftermath of the period. They live well and comfortably, enjoy perpetually good weather. How could it be otherwise? These German children had not experienced any of the difficulties that Bonhoeffer had in his childhood. He felt that that had made them soft and unwilling to engage seriously with religion. He worried he would never get through to them. But slowly and surely, he did. The number of kids attending the ministry grew week by week. Bonhoeffer charmed them with his energetic preaching style and his insistence on treating them as equals. I showed them the splendid things that the children's service could offer, and that caught fire. Have to see what happens next time. The session has virtually transformed me. The slight anxiety that I couldn't get going with the practical work has vanished. Bonhoeffer's got this really good gift with young people. He he likes kids. He's good with them. Reggie Williams is a professor of Christian ethics at the McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago. He wrote a book about this period of Bonhoeffer's life called Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus. Williams has identified this period in Barcelona as a critical moment for Bonhoeffer. You see, he had learned theology from the most brilliant professors. He had written a dissertation on church community, but he had never actually preached the gospel. 
Now he got his chance. After a few weeks in the children's ministry, he was asked to fill in for the senior pastor one Sunday. He dedicated his first sermon in Barcelona to the doctrine of justification that is at the center of Lutheranism. This idea that humans can't earn God's salvation through what they do, but that salvation is simply given by God to the faithful out of grace. If there's anything at all on this earth that is not trivial or comical, it is the fact of justification. But Bonhoeffer argued that to accept God's grace without trying to make oneself worthy of it was almost an insult. He said that the gift of God's grace ought to inspire people to live more by faith. In a way, he was scolding this congregation of disinterested Christians that they needed to better appreciate what God had given them. The congregation had never heard anything quite like this sermon. It was provocative, thoughtful, but also deeply academic. No amount of sunshine and wine could take away from the fact that Bonhoeffer was first and foremost a theologian. His words seemed to touch a nerve with the worshipers. He would go on to give many more well-attended sermons over the course of his term in Barcelona. He even got people to come to a series of academic lectures. Um, he preaches some 20 sermons and gives three academic lectures. It's really interesting um, that one would give academic lectures in a congregational setting. I don't know if a church that would, that would be able to sustain heavy academic lectures from a pastor you know, with a completed PhD in theology. In those lectures, we get a glimpse of Bonhoeffer's mind. Um, and he's in this kind of malaise. For all the fun he was having and the success he enjoyed in Barcelona, Bonhoeffer struggled behind the scenes. He knew that he would have to return to Berlin at the end of his year-long term to complete his second dissertation, a requirement for teaching. The thought of returning to the ivory tower distressed him. He had fallen for the Barcelona sunshine and loved practical work as a pastor. He kept himself so busy with his parties and parish work that he had no time for academic writing. He's not at all excited about sitting under a professor in a class with obligatory lectures and obligatory textbooks. He wrote to his old professor, Adolf von Harnack, that, I have acquired a measure of freedom from didactic doctrine. I can recognize the limits of the value of pure scholarship. He didn't want to return to the bourgeois circles he ran with in Berlin. As the assistant pastor, he was responsible for much of the church's philanthropy. He met people who were struggling to survive, and it woke him up to the world outside of his charmed existence. I'm getting to know new people each day. People with passions, criminal types, people who are homeless both physically and spiritually. Real people. I have the impression that these people stand more under grace than the Christian world. Bonhoeffer's approach to faith had changed. He wasn't interested in learning about it through books. He wanted to learn about faith through community and lived experience and service. The kind of understanding that he had written about in his first dissertation. One really finds oneself forced to reassess one's theology from the ground up. The theology of the spring and summer is momentarily taking the place of the Berlin winter theology. My theology is beginning to become humanistic. He even questioned whether or not he had chosen the right path in life. He actually makes the statement that he doesn't believe that theology can hold him for very long. But he was a Bonhoeffer. He would not be able to escape the pressure to live up to his name. By the fall of 1929, he had accepted that he would have to return to Berlin. He prepared to give his last two lectures in Barcelona. These final lectures reveal a lot about how Bonhoeffer was thinking about God at this moment in his life. The first would become one of his best-remembered speeches. In it, Bonhoeffer once again implored his audience to make Christianity a greater part of their lives. To the 19th and 20th century mind, religion plays the part of a parlor into which one doesn't mind withdrawing for a couple hours, but from which one then immediately returns to business. One thing, however, is clear. We understand Christ only if we commit to him. 
He was not nailed to the cross as an ornament or decoration for our lives. If we would have him, we must recognize that he makes fundamental claims on our entire being. He ended this passionate lecture with a now famous quote. The religion of Christ is not a tidbit after the bread. It is the bread itself, or it is nothing. Bonhoeffer was searching for a church community that practiced embodied faith, one that wasn't just going through the motions. His final lecture in Barcelona is also well-known, but not for any good reasons. In this lecture, which was on the question of Christian ethics, Bonhoeffer reiterated and expanded upon the idea that a German's relationship with God was tied up in their dedication to the fatherland. He is like many people in Germany at the time, concerned about the state of the country. And in his concern for the state of the country, he, he speaks in this tone of loyalty to the country. He says things like, I am what I am because of my people. And he uses this term folk, which is difficult to translate into English. If you remember from the last episode, the word Volk is a term that combines the idea of ethnicity and nationhood and excludes outsiders. It would be a rallying cry for the Nazis in a decade or so. He speaks in this very folkish theological language that even justifies, that he says, love of my people, of the folk will justify war, will justify murder. In this lecture, Bonhoeffer openly dismissed Jesus' Sermon on the Mount which implored Christians to love their neighbor and their enemy. He called these commandments meaningless and impractical in the context of war. He dismissed the very idea of a Christian ethic. One absolutely cannot speak about specific ethical problems from a Christian perspective. Ethics did not simply descend to earth from heaven. Ethics is a matter of blood and history. Its face changes with history and with the renewal of blood. It is a clear indication that this early Bonhoeffer, this young Bonhoeffer, and this time speaking in these grandiose ways, is in step with what would become later focused theology, which is in support of, you know, the National Socialists. The word at that time, not a significant movement, but the ideology that gave rise to them was already there. From this lecture, it seems that the German nationalism of Bonhoeffer's youth had only grown. Despite his claims about embracing a humanistic theology, the coda to his time in Barcelona was a lecture that contained all the tropes of what would become Nazi theology. A few months later, Bonhoeffer got on a train back to Berlin, more confused than at any point in his life. His theology had been upended, split between humanism and nationalism. He longed for a truly faithful church community, but had not yet found one. In a few months, he would leave on another trip that would provide him clarity on both fronts. But first, he had to return to Berlin, to his family, and to his postdoctoral studies at the university. One world has sunk, and a new, or rather old, gray one, covered in the moss of tradition, stretches out his hand— the air is close in Germany, close and musty enough to suffocate you, and everywhere it smells like sweat. But then, what else can I do but go ahead and breathe this air and get on with everything? Bonhoeffer now resented life in Berlin. He called it banal and dull. He hated having to grade papers of theology students whose arguments he called, quote, excruciatingly dumb. He retreated into his office and worked tirelessly on his second dissertation. After just six months, Bonhoeffer emerged with the completed thesis. It was titled Act and Being and was over a hundred pages long. The second dissertation, Act and Being, this, the subtitle Transcendental Philosophy and Ontology in Systematic Theology, is sort of primarily methodological. You met Lori Brant Hale in the last episode. She's the vice president of the International Bonhoeffer Society, and she co-wrote a book called Bonhoeffer for Armchair Theologians. He's writing it as a second dissertation. 
It's required to to qualify him as a lecturer at Berlin. In Acton Being, Bonhoeffer engages with the writings of some of the best-known continental philosophers to answer some fundamental theological questions. Do we understand God as act? Do we understand God as being? What are the limits of human creatureliness? And so he's he's leaning into philosophical thinkers like Kant and Husserl and Heidegger. Bonhoeffer ultimately comes up with a third way to understand God in the concept of a person. A person, Bonhoeffer argues, is both an act in that they are created and they are a being. Therefore, the person, namely the figure of Christ, is the best way to understand God. That's an overly simple explanation. The work is a scholarly masterpiece, but it's pretty unapproachable to any layman. This is probably the least accessible of his work, right, for the sort of public audience. Bonhoeffer ends the thesis with a reflection on the role of children in the church. He argued that children had a more full and innocent relationship with God. They were ideas that were sparked in the youth ministry in Barcelona. And clearly, Barcelona was on his mind. A few weeks after he submitted the work in the spring of 1930, Bonhoeffer left Berlin for the Spanish city without a thought. He was in Barcelona when it was read and approved. He returned a while later to defend the dissertation and go through the required trial sermon and lecture. And though his mind and body were present in Berlin, his spirit was long gone. The cold German capital, his childhood home, was almost anathema to him. He longed for new experiences in new lands. He announced to his family and friends that he had accepted a postdoctoral fellowship at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, thousands of miles and an ocean away. Here's Reggie Williams again. He's fairly disillusioned and he's in a state of deadlock. This is one of the reasons why it's important to recognize that New York is an important thing that clears up this deadlock for him. Dietrich Bonhoeffer boarded a ship bound for New York City on September 6th, 1930. He arrived a week later, and like so many throughout the years, he was first taken aback by the skyline. He steps off the boat in New York to um, the Chrysler Building being built as the tallest building in the United States at that time. From the water, these architectural marvels made New York seem like a city of opulence and grandeur. But this was the fall of 1930. A year before, the stock market had crashed and ushered in economic disaster. Bank buying stabilized things for a few days, but on October 29, Black Tuesday, the bottom dropped out. The average price of major stocks falling nearly 40 points with chaos at the New York Stock Exchange. Nowhere was that disaster more evident than New York City. Bonhoeffer had never seen anything like it. One feels like one is standing on an observation tower, looking out over the whole world, and no matter where one looks, most of what one sees is infinitely depressing. He meets poverty, New York mired in it, to scenes of extreme hunger. It's the Great Depression. Bonhoeffer had come to New York to study at Union Theological Seminary, then the foremost institution of Protestant theology in the United States. He moved into a dormitory near the seminary's campus on Manhattan's Upper West Side and quickly settled into his coursework. He also is not impressed at the theological condition of the seminary. Not initially. Not at all. The theology taught at Union was similar to that of the University of Berlin. The theologians there were liberal. They saw religion as primarily a moralizing tool for civilization. They weren't interested in probing deep, transcendental questions about salvation and justification. Bonhoeffer stepped inside of a progressive religion that sees a connection between modernity and the march forward towards utopia and the faith. Well, the dominant liberalism present at Union at that time wants to hold on to something that we might call faith, but to do it in such a way that blends 
the hope of modernity towards a better humanity with religion. In America, liberal theologians at this time ascribed to the idea of the social gospel. The primary idea behind the social gospel is using religion for social change. Joel Looper is a religious scholar at Baylor University. He wrote a book on Bonhoeffer's year in America. It's the view that religion is a human power that is used for social good and that the transcendent referent of, you know, of what God is doing in the world, you know, that's, that's not really the most important thing. Many of those who subscribe to the social gospel saw religion as a means to an end. God, scripture, and salvation, these things were only useful towards that end. Bonhoeffer was disappointed. He had come to America to broaden his understanding of God, but what he found at Union was an even greater adherence to the liberal theology that he had disliked in Berlin. He reported back to a friend that, quote, there is no theology here. They talk a blue streak without the slightest substantive foundation and with no evidence of any criteria. The students are completely clueless. They are not familiar with even the most basic questions. They become intoxicated with liberal and humanistic phrases and are amused at the fundamentalists and yet basically are not even up to their level. There's one professor in particular that came to define Bonhoeffer's experience at Union. His name was Reinhold Niebuhr. Well, Reinhold Niebuhr was probably the foremost American religious thinker of the 20th century in a number of ways. He's at least the most famous. He taught at Union Theological Seminary for more than 30 years. Niebuhr's approach to theology was idiosyncratic. It was largely liberal in that he saw religion primarily as a tool for social good and the transcendental stuff as secondary. But Niebuhr also critiqued the liberals as being far too naive about the transformative power of faith. He implored Christians to engage with the world as it truly was, not to aim for some utopia. He called himself a Christian realist. In the later years of his life, Bonhoeffer would come to appreciate and adopt many elements of Niebuhr's theology. But as a student at Union, Bonhoeffer could hardly stand the man. For Niebuhr, the question was really about efficacy. What political efficacy does this religious principle or religious idea have? He says, it's time that we put the metaphysical questions on the shelf for a while. You know, if we can't use religion to solve these problems of our society and, and to help people, then you know, we've got to put it aside. What else, what else is religion for? And <laughs> Um, I think Bonhoeffer thought this was just impardonably stupid. Their early animus stemmed from a serious religious disagreement. Bonhoeffer was interested in exploring precisely the metaphysical aspects of the gospel that Niebuhr dismissed. Bonhoeffer uh, reportedly, um, often he would begin class by taking some notes, and but then his pen would just kind of you know, be set down on his desk. <laughs> um, you know, he wasn't terribly interested. He didn't think he was learning anything here. The class papers that he turned in for Niebuhr were very standard Lutheran reformational stuff. And Niebuhr at one point commented on one of his papers, well, in making grace as transcendent as you do, I just don't understand what it's worth. There has to be a practical outworking of it for it to be of any ethical import. In fact, Niebuhr encouraged outright mockery of Bonhoeffer's Lutheran idealism. Bonhoeffer references some uh, in, in one of his reports home that Union students were, were laughing at quotes from Martin Luther about grace and sin and whatnot, justification. Bonhoeffer was offended. He, he seems to have been personally taken aback. The very idea that someone would laugh at Luther. They have a naive know-it-all attitude here. It just burns me up when people here deal with Christ 
and are then done with him. They laugh insolently if I present a citation from Luther. It wasn't that Bonhoeffer disagreed with Niebuhr, that religion could be a force for good. He had made it clear in his words and his actions that he thought it could be. What Bonhoeffer disagreed with was that religion ought to be used for any purpose. Faith wasn't a tool or an instrument. It simply was. The transcendental stuff, the gospel, the doctrine of justification, these things weren't distractions to Bonhoeffer. They were the whole point. Frustrated with his experiences at Union, Bonhoeffer took comfort in the friendship of his classmates. He quickly grew close to one, a Frenchman named Jean Le Serre. Le Serre was born in Switzerland to French parents. True to his birthright, he was a dedicated pacifist. His theology revolved around the idea that Christ demanded peace between nations and people. He was a strong advocate for the ecumenical movement, which encouraged cooperation between churches regardless of national borders. Bonhoeffer was aware of ecumenism, but had never taken it seriously. It was, in many ways, antithetical to the nationalist theology of German Lutheranism. But his conversations and experiences with Le Serre began to change that. One evening, the two students went to see All Quiet on the Western Front. It's a movie about the First World War, told from the perspective of German soldiers. This is the immortal screen achievement, which has become more dramatic, more vital, with every passing year. Here's Reggie See Williams. See it again. Bonhoeffer was disturbed by what he was seeing through the eyes of his French friend. The Americans in the movie theater were cheering when the Germans were shooting French soldiers. The cheers at French people dying uh, were disturbing for Bonhoeffer, who could see that it was upsetting his French friend. It was this moment of empathy. Bonhoeffer stormed out of the theater, sick to his stomach. The First World War had been such an important experience for him. It had justified nationalism and violence. But he had never before been confronted with the consequences of those ideas, like he was in that theater next to the Frenchman, Jean Le Serre. The influence of ecumenism on Bonhoeffer only grew from there. Shortly after his experience in the theater, he attended an ecumenical conference in Washington, D.C. And he hears them pass a resolution saying that they don't blame Germany for the war. It throws open Bonhoeffer's understanding of the church from, you know, defense of the German people to more relationship with a, a broader Christian family outside of Germany. Later in his life, Bonhoeffer would become an integral part of the ecumenical movement. That journey began in America. Outside of his budding friendship with Lasserre, Bonhoeffer mostly kept to himself that first semester at Union. He, he did his own thing. Well, he comes to New York and he's set on doing something along those lines of his own thing. While he does do some learning at the seminary, he is off on his own. That's how he finds Harlem. Bonhoeffer first came to Harlem in October of 1929 as a tourist. He goes to Harlem on just a tour. He kept the, a flyer that I found in his belongings in Germany. He kept a flyer that was advertising this trip to Harlem and its major centers. Harlem is in vogue in that moment. It is a place of the creation of black culture. And it's, it's being read, or at least many of its major literary scholars are being read in a course he's taking with Reinhold Niebuhr. In what was perhaps the only part of Niebuhr's class that he enjoyed, Bonhoeffer read classics of black literature from writers like County Cullen, Langston Hughes, and W.E.B. Du Bois. He wanted to learn more he ends up not just touring Harlem as a tourist. He spends most, if not all, of his free time there. But he also goes to Schomburg, the Harlem branch of the New York Public Library, and he gets a bibliography of major writers from that time. I've looked through that bibliography. It's got a coffee stain on the front of it. And he's a member of, he joins the YMCA, 
I mean, he makes it a, a second hub of study. Bonhoeffer's experiences in Harlem became far richer thanks to his budding friendship with Albert Franklin Fisher, a fellow classmate of his at Union. Al Fisher uh, was son of a preacher and a scholar. His studies at uh, Union found him as one of two black people there, at least so far as I could find, it was just two of them. And it was an uptick in black students at Union uh, during his time there. He becomes good friends with, with Bonhoeffer, the German Sloan fellow. Um, they become pretty tight. As Bonhoeffer and Fischer grew closer, the American introduced the German to the Harlem that existed outside of books. It was Fischer who first brought Bonhoeffer to the site where his theology and his politics would fundamentally shift. That was Abyssinian Baptist Church. This is the location that moves him from academic theologian in step with some of the harmful uh, currents in theology in Germany and national folkish life into what becomes for him our genuine faith. So much has happened in this church over the years. We have had great times. We have had not so great times. Remember Sandra McNeil? She's the historian of Abyssinian Baptist. I met with her to learn more about the church, about its history and mission. We've always had the philosophy of church and community. Now, how much history do you want? Abyssinian Baptist was founded in 1808 when a group of black worshipers became fed up with segregated and unequal services. Slavery was still the law of the land in New York. Before the Abyssinian Baptist Church was founded, blacks, enslaved blacks, as well as free men of color, men and women of color, worshiped with the first Baptist church they were set aside in an area far removed from um, the pulpit. They could barely even hear what the, the, the pastor, or the preacher, was saying. After asking for permission to sit in other places, or to be a part of the congregation itself, um, and being told, no, that cannot happen. One Sunday, the folk just got tired and got up and left. These black worshipers wrote a letter asking First Baptist Church for permission to start their own congregation. The request was granted. This is the proper way that a church is to come about. There is an old saying <laughs> that most Baptist churches multiply by dividing. So by getting this permission, it enables the church, if they're having hard times, to go back to the parent church and ask for help. And more often than not, in the past, it was given. Since then, Abyssinian has been a center for Black worship and life in New York City. It's moved all over the place, usually to follow Black New Yorkers who moved around for economic opportunity or were displaced by gentrification. At the turn of the 20th century, the Black population in New York exploded. Black migrants from the South and the Caribbean came by the thousands to seek better lives and flee racist regimes. The early uh, 1900s was a period of great migration. Southerners like myself were just moving north. If you look at the map, you'll see this great migration northward. And much of it was because... Uh, Things were harder in the South than they were hard up here. Most of these migrants settled in Harlem. In 1923, Abyssinian Baptist followed them. The congregation built their current building on 138th Street for a little over $300,000. There was a mortgage of $60,000 that was unpaid. And we had 12 years to pay that balance. There was a tithing campaign and the congregation paid that balance 
within five years, which meant that 1928, this church and sanctuary was completely paid for. This was an exceptional thing and a wonderful thing because in 1929, there was the Great Depression. It meant that this church was in a, in a position to help the church family and the community in ways that it was unable to do so before because it didn't have a mortgage over its head. Black migrants had come to Harlem in search of better lives outside of the Jim Crow South. But things in New York were not much better. Here's Reggie Williams. These migrants coming from the South to the North are finding higher rents, lowest paying jobs. They're still finding a significant discrimination in the North. They come with a dream of a better life to find that dream cast in a northern practice of white supremacy. Systemic inequality and racism in the form of things like redlining, police brutality, and hiring discrimination were still ever present. And when the depression hit, it hit black New Yorkers especially hard. And as the saying goes, when white America gets a cold, black America gets pneumonia. The Great Depression is heavy hitting on black people in Harlem. Because Abyssinian Baptist had already paid off its mortgage, the church was able to sustain its community. Abyssinian provided jobs, food, and shelter for struggling Harlem residents. This was in large part thanks to the vision of Abyssinian's senior reverend, a man named Adam Clayton Powell Sr. Powell was a self-made theologian. He grew up poor and rose quickly through the theological ranks. He went to Yale Divinity School and got his divinity degree in 1904. He came to Abyssinian just four years later and grew the church to 10,000 members, the largest Protestant congregation in the country. And it was his decision to move the church to Harlem. Powell had been the head of Abyssinian for 20 years when the Depression struck. It's a funny story. Powell talks about driving Lenox Avenue and it's now on Malcolm X Boulevard in his brand new car that the church has bought for him, which he didn't want, but it's a really nice car. And he's driving and he's seeing the way that the Great Depression is ravaging black life in Harlem. And he's just really mortified by this. God, why don't you do something? Says a couple of days later, he's asleep. And in his sleep, he hears, Adam, why don't you do something? Like any good preacher would do, he develops a sermon series. Powell developed a series of sermons that outlined a vision for the church that was focused on service to the community. More than a place to go on Sundays, Powell argued that a church ought to be an institution. The institutional church was making a way for Black people who didn't have resources in society when they made their way up north. Uh, the church provided for them in terms of a, a bank, maybe even helping with real estate, with child care, you know, with job placement and so forth. This is the birth of the institutional church. Uh, the church becomes the center of the community. Churches had certainly existed to serve communities for thousands of years, but never at this scale. Powell is often associated with the idea of the social gospel because of this campaign. But there's more to it than that. Powell didn't see Christianity as merely a means to an end, like many of the theologians at Union did. Powell did so because he understood that to serve your sister and brother is to serve Christ. Powell took Christ's Sermon on the Mount seriously. He believed that the poor, hungry, and wretched would inherit the kingdom of God. He preached the social gospel not because he saw religion as a tool, but because he believed it was what God commanded him to do. When Bonhoeffer accompanied his friend Al Fisher to Abyssinian, he heard Powell preach. Joel Luper wrote about that moment. He mentions hearing a sermon that he thought was entirely biblical or, you know, or gospel-oriented. But he, he heard this from Adam Clayton Powell Sr. at, at Abyssinian. And he was struck. He was struck, I think, uh, by the music, 
by the whole scene of African Americans were living under the weight of oppression, you know, coming together and worshiping. I don't think it's possible to overestimate the the sort of disruptive quality that that might have had on on Bonhoeffer, at least in certain ways. Um, I, I think seeing the oppressed worshiping God opened his eyes to the view from below, as he would later put it. For the first time in his life, Bonhoeffer saw a church that matched his vision. He saw Christ existing as a church community where people recognized their ethical demands on one another. He found a church that people went to seven days a week, where faith in God was woven into everyday life, and where people thought really deeply about what it meant to be Christian. All of the theological threads that he had begun spinning in Berlin, in Paris, in Rome, they all found their terminus in Harlem. During the winter of 1930 and 1931, he came back to Abyssinian week after week. He loved the energy of Sunday services, the call and response, the involvement of the congregation. He was in awe of the pipe organ and enthralled by African-American spirituals and gospel music. Al Fisher even gave him a collection of black spirituals as a New Year's gift. I believe that the spiritual songs of the Southern Negroes represent some of the greatest artistic achievements in America. Though he was never a member of the church ministry, Bonhoeffer did teach Sunday school classes at Abyssinian, among other activities. He forged close friendships with his fellow worshipers. He's not just teaching young people in Sunday school. He's also teaching a midweek Bible study to black women which is like a Wednesday night Bible study. So he's, he's embedded within the church, not just as a spectator. At Abyssinian, Bonhoeffer saw and began to appreciate a different form of Christianity. One that centered the marginalized, upraised the oppressed, and looked to the Bible for ethics. He had seen a similar kind of Christianity in the poorer districts of Paris, Berlin, and Barcelona, but had never really dwelled on it. At Abyssinian, he was forced to reckon with his own privilege and with the bourgeois imperial Christianity of his upbringing. Martin Luther wrote in 1518 about two different types of theology that stood in opposition to one another. One was Theologia Gloriae, a theology of glory which emphasized the power and might of the kingdom of heaven and projected the strength of God. The other was the Theologia Crucia, a theology of the cross, which emphasized the suffering of Christ and identified with the oppressed. In Europe, the theology of glory had been used for hundreds of years to justify global imperialism and war. It provided a divine mandate for forcefully sweeping Christianity across the globe. The Germany of Bonhoeffer's youth was no exception. One way to describe this is by reference to Jesus risen with all power. A faith system that accompanies colonialism. That is religious endorsement of imperial powers and their practice of civilizing the world. At Abyssinian, however, worshipers embrace the theology of the cross. This is a Jesus who is not risen in power, but who suffers with us. This is a God who comes into the experience of the outcast, marginalized, the oppressed. Once Bonhoeffer understood this, it changed him. Bonhoeffer is a theologian trained to be a theologian in imperial Europe. He crosses the Atlantic Ocean. This space is riddled with the bodies of Africans who are, you know, I'm putting scare quotes, godless heathens brought into the worldview of a Christian Western world with a Jesus risen in power. So this is not a Jesus of power and domination. This is a Jesus uh, who knows suffering. 
they were talking about Christ as the center of their lives as well. But this Christ at the center is not the one dominating in power as apologetics for global rule and domination. This is one who makes sense of the suffering that black people endure in the United States at the hands of powerful, harmful politics. And he becomes aware of that. Um, he becomes he becomes aware of this Jesus, and it makes a difference for him. I, I would say this this makes a significant difference for him. Sandra McNeil refers to this moment as Bonhoeffer's conversion. It was the the God that was preached from our pulpits, uh, the Christ that Bonhoeffer really didn't know. He'd never gotten Christianity in this way before. He was mesmerized, converted. (laughs) Just a year before, while preaching in Barcelona, Bonhoeffer had dismissed the Sermon on the Mount and its ethical commandments. Now, thanks to the sermons of Adam Clayton Powell and his friendship with John Lasserre, he embraced it. Then he had declared that there was no Christian ethic. Now his theology became expressly ethical. More than that, it became political. As was typical of German Lutherans, Bonhoeffer had stayed away from political issues because he saw them as a distraction from the message of the gospel. But when he was confronted about the horrors of American white supremacy, he was disgusted. But he does see people lynched. I shouldn't say he doesn't watch lynchings. He hears about them. He sees postcards. This is one of the things that the lynchers would do in the United States at that time is they would take pictures and they would sell them as postcards. It's a really ghastly practice. I must say, it's deeply distressing. One gets to see something of the real face of America, something that is hidden behind the veil of words in the American Constitution saying that all men are created free and equal. He felt he had to do something. When nine black boys were falsely accused of the rape of a white woman in Scottsboro, Alabama, Bonhoeffer felt compelled to act. The case had garnered international attention. He thought he might be able to get some help from back home. He wrote a letter to the Lutheran church and asked for their help in the matter. He gets a letter back saying that that's a political issue. It's not one that relates to the gospel. The church speaks the language of the gospel, not in political tones. That stays with him. His concern or his disappointment about that stays with him. It was a sign of the distance that now existed between Bonhoeffer and the apolitical nationalistic religion of his youth. In a bit of marginalia that he wrote in his notebook at this time, he wondered, what is a flag to God? Bonhoeffer's experience at Abyssinian softened his feelings towards Union as he entered his second semester. He still found the theology there to be shallow, but he had a new respect for the political service of the liberal theologians. His classmates and his professors introduced him to the world of social activism. The social gospel began to inform more and more of his theology. As his second and final semester at Union came to an end, Bonhoeffer began to think once more about returning to Germany. He decided that he wanted to travel and see more of the Americas before he left. Shortly after his classes wrapped up, he left for Mexico City with John Lasserre and another friend. Their route took them directly through the American South. Here's Joel Looper. And during that uh, part of the trip, Bonhoeffer you know, got to see what the Jim Crow South was about. And... He was really disturbed. Dietrich wrote a letter to his brother Carl Friedrich, detailing the injustice that he saw. Carl Friedrich, who had spent some time in the States, responded and said that he agreed it was terrible. He said he had even turned down a job in America so that his future children would not be raised in such a racist environment. He compared it to the situation of Jews in Germany, saying that, quote, our Jewish question is a joke compared to it. Only a few would still claim to be repressed here, end quote. In retrospect, 
These words are chilling. At that very moment, the Nazi party was gaining a foothold in German politics. In September of 1930, Bonhoeffer's first month at Union, the Weimar Republic held elections. Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Party increased their seats in the Reichstag from 14 to 107. They were the second largest party in Germany. As the Nazis grew in power, hatred and violence towards Jews did as well. Newspapers in the States warned almost daily of rising fascism and anti-Semitism in Germany. Bonhoeffer's friends and family wrote to him about a highly agitated fascist movement that was brewing in the countryside. But he had little grasp of how bad things were getting. He would soon have to confront it head on. Bonhoeffer left New York for Germany in June of 1931. He said goodbye to his new friends and boarded a transatlantic ferry. Among the things he packed was a book of NAACP literature and the collection of African-American spirituals that his friend Al Fisher had given him. On that trip back, he would write that his experience engaging with the Black Christ in Harlem was one of the most important and gratifying events of his year in America. I heard the gospel preached in the Negro churches. Here, one really could still hear someone talk in a Christian sense about sin and grace and the love of God and ultimate hope. In contrast to the often lecture-like character of the white sermon, the black Christ is preached with captivating passion and vividness. He arrived home a week later, a changed man. The Bonhoeffer who returns from New York, let's talk about first what has not changed. The fundamental structure of his theology hasn't changed. Christ is still the center, but the way in which Christ is the center has undergone some significant developments. Talk about Christ as co-sufferer uh, and this empathic turn towards recognizing the need to act politically for the sake of loving your neighbor. Christ is now a witness for peace. Years later, Bonhoeffer would write of his time in New York that Something different came, something that has changed and transformed my life to this very day. For the first time, I came to the Bible, especially the Sermon on the Mount, and it freed me from all this. Since then, everything changed. It was a great liberation. Bonhoeffer is now going to church on a regular basis. And his faith means something for him personally. There's this real turn towards piety in him, as other people around him notice it. He's reading the Bible and looking for ways in which the Bible speaks normatively for Christians, which is a big change for him. He's asking questions about, can the church say anything that's normative for the Christian? Make claims on our daily, uh, our, our behavior. That's not something that Bonhoeffer before New York considered in any significant way. One of the first things that Bonhoeffer did upon his return was to link up with his good friend and fellow theologian, Franz Hildebrandt. Hildebrandt was a Christian of Jewish descent. The two of them sat down and wrote what they called, quote, an attempt at a Lutheran catechism. For Reggie Williams, this work shows how much Bonhoeffer had changed in the last year. This is the section that he wrote um, in the catechism just after he came back. I'm just going to read it. Quote, God has arranged it so that all races of humanity of the earth come from one blood. Acts 17, 26. Therefore, a defiant ethnic pride in flesh and blood is a sin against the Holy Spirit. Unquote. In Barcelona, Bonhoeffer had preached about the importance of ethnic pride to German Lutherans. He used the nationalist language of Volkish theology to justify war and murder. Now he denounced ethnic pride. It was a testament to the lessons of his year in New York, of his friendship with Jean Lasserre and Al Fisher, of the Sunday mornings spent listening to Adam Clayton Powell at Abyssinian, and of the social gospel he learned at Union. All of those experiences set Bonhoeffer onto the path to becoming the saintly figure we know today. 
These shifts in his theology, away from German nationalism and apolitical Lutheranism, and towards ecumenicalism and the suffering Christ, set him up to become a lonely but fierce voice against the rise of the Nazis. Reggie Williams refers to Bonhoeffer's new theological values as imported goods. These are new turns for him. These are what I, what I might say imported goods. In his nearly 15-year struggle against Nazi rule, Bonhoeffer would look to his time in America for inspiration again and again. The role that Harlem played in the Bonhoeffer of 1931 through 1945 is significant. He would not have had the history of that experience to guide the way he was thinking during the resistance if it weren't for Harlem. We can say that unequivocally. In 1933, just two years later, Adolf Hitler would be made chancellor of Germany. Bonhoeffer's imported goods would become more important than ever. On the next episode of From Sin to Saint, we will look at Bonhoeffer's decade-long struggle with Nazi rule in Germany, from his immediate defiance of Hitler to his work training a new generation of anti-fascist theologians. And finally, his return to New York and his fateful decision to go back home to Germany, where he would give his life for what he believed in. For Pathios, I'm Josh Lash. <laughs>